Hey everyone, how are we doing? Good, my name is Kelsey, I'm on the enterprise team here at Classy and I have the privilege of introducing the next session, Progress in Poverty Relief and Water Access. We have three different speakers. First, we're gonna start off with Gary White. He is the CEO and founder of water.org. He also developed and now leads Water Equity which is an innovation of water.org focused on raising and deploying social impact investment capital. In 2011, he was named the Time 100 list of the world's most influential people. And in 2014, he was named to the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Water. So please welcome Gary White. Is the mic, there we go, we got it. Ah, quicker. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. It's good to be here to talk to you about what's my passion, and that is water and sanitation in developing countries, and the journey that we've been on at water.org, and now, now water equity. I think, you know, people here probably get the fact that, that water, and probably also get the fact that sanitation as well, is a massive problem for people living in developing countries. So. I'm not going to spend a ton of time today kind of diving into the problem except to highlight how it can actually be the seed to the solution to the crisis. But I did want to touch on the, the aspects of the crisis a bit and then get into, you know, what has water.org been doing over the trajectory of its history dating back to 1990 and how, that or, how, how our organization has uh, evolved and how we've used social entrepreneurship as kind of our anchor to get better, faster solutions to the problem. And then just highlight a couple of innovations that we've stepped through, Water Credit, and now Water Equity, which is a social impact investing fund. So uh, right now, about 663 million people lack access to safe water around the world. Uh, another 2.4 billion people lack access to a proper toilet and sanitation. And if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG number six is all about solving this problem. And one thing to note about the 663 million is the way that SDGs were constructed relative to the Millennium Development Goals, the bar has been raised in terms of what it means for people to have access to safe water. So if you look at the MDG goal with respect to water, there's only 663 million people uh, who need to acquire that service uh, from the MDG perspective. Now with the bar being raised to what's called safely managed water and sanitation services, which is basically water access 24 seven, that number shot up to about 1.8 billion. So the bar has been raised, so the goal is even more challenging. So one child dies every 90 seconds from a water-related disease. That's really just unfathomable that uh, for a problem that we've solved 100 years ago, safe water and sanitation, that this should still be such a global crisis. And a little bit about our priorities. You know, more people in the world have access to a mobile phone than a toilet. So this problem has been around for so long and it's been so intractable because we haven't really put the innovation and the, the, horse, the mental horsepower behind solving it. Imagine if we could put as much energy and effort and technology and, and expertise to work solving this crisis as we put towards solving the crisis of the next smartphone. You know, we could probably get this problem fixed. And if you look at the resources that go into this, and this is kind of an important foundational piece for what we're doing at water.org with water, credit and water equity. And that is the fact that it would take about $200 billion a year in capital to be able to solve this crisis, $200 billion over the next five years. And if you look at all of the development assistance and aid and charity that's going into solving the crisis, it's only about $8 billion a year. So this leads us as an organization at water.org to think, should we be about just raising more money and drilling more wells and building more toilets? Or do we need to think about it in a fundamentally different way? Because traditional charity is never going to get us to solve the problem. 
So that's the problem, and that's kind of some of the foreshadowing of what our solutions might look like in terms of finance. But just to give you the, the, the trajectory of our history, this really started in 1990 when I just brought some friends and family together uh, in my hometown of Kansas City. And we raised about $4,500 that night and funded one project in a community called El Limon, Honduras. And from there, it's really grown very organically uh, for many years, but it's evolved into what we are today. And a couple of the, the key milestones really is this concept of water credit that we started to develop in 2003. And I'll dive into that a little bit more because that really is the crux of this financial solution. And then in 2009, we we're fortunate to catch up with Matt Damon's organization, H2O Africa, and we're working with them. And then Matt and I thought it would be much more efficient if we were just merge the two organizations. So Matt and I then became the co-founders of Water.org in 2009. And then in 2015, we started looking at an extension of our water credit initiative, and that was how can we raise social impact capital in addition to philanthropy? Social in impact capital meaning it would provide a financial return to investors in the US and Europe, but it would also provide a huge social return in the, in the form of people getting access to water and sanitation. That went very well, 2017, we're spinning off Water Equity, which will be a separate entity, parallel with Water.org, that will be focused exclusively on raising social impact capital and deploying it to water and sanitation solutions at the base of the pyramid. So if we look at uh, what Water Credit and Water.org has achieved to date, we've reached more than 6.9 people, 6.9 million people with water and sanitation. And water credit accounts for 6.1 million of those people. So you can see the incredible leverage we're getting with water credit as opposed to just doing a more traditional approach, which we did in our early days of water.org. Uh, water and to put this into perspective, the first quarter of this year, this calendar year, we reached 1 million people with water and or sanitation just in the first quarter. That was more than we reached in the first 20 years of the organization, taking a more uh, direct impact type of approach with wells and pumps and things like that. So water credit. So bear with me a minute because the water and sanitation crisis is complex. And sometimes it requires solutions that are more complex, like I said, than just drilling more wells. So water credit recognizes the fact that people living in poverty around the world are already spending huge amounts of money to get access to water. They're paying water vendors who sell water in their neighborhoods in the slums 10 to 15 times more per liter for that water than if they could get connected to the public utility and pay a small water tariff. They're paying in terms of the time that they spend scavenging for water, walking for water every day, hours. This money runs into the hundreds of billions of dollars every year that the poor are paying for water and sanitation services. So we believe that if we could help them redirect that, they would be much better off, but they needed access to capital, to loans. They needed a loan so that they could pay a connection fee to a public utility, because that might cost $200. They might be able to spend you know, 20 or 30 cents a day securing their water from the vendors, but they didn't have $200 up front. So we allowed them to get a water credit loan. People who wanted to get access to improved sanitation, women in particular, so they didn't have to wait until the cover of night to go out and defecate or spend hours every day walking to a private place and not earning income because they were sacrificing all of that time. So water credit basically gets microfinance institutions into the space. We support them with what we call our smart subsidies and get them to deliver these types of loans. So now 99% of those loans are repaid. We have uh, partnered with more than 69 microfinance institutions around the world to develop these loan products, and the average loan size is $260. So we've put about $18 million into getting this whole system jump-started, and that's leveraged about $370 million in external commercial capital that's come in to meet these needs. So that's $369 million in charity 
we didn't need to raise that the market brought to the problem. So just a, one example, I have a few minutes just to bring this to life. A woman I met in Bangalore, India, was paying 20 rupees a day for her water from the water vendors for her family. She was paying 20 rupees a day so her family could go use the public toilet. And the, it was a pay toilet. So 40 rupees, about 1,200 rupees every month so she could cope with her water and sanitation situation. She took out a loan for a water connection. She now has a water connection in her home. And she took out a loan for a toilet that she would have in her home. The combined payments for her water credit loan for those two loans was 1,200 rupees every month. So once she gets through the two years of repaying that loan, then she'll be free and clear of that. She'll have a very modest water tariff and her family will have their own toilet. So you can see there's a, a real poverty trap here. You know, if you're too poor to afford this capital in the context of water and sanitation, you're going to be stuck there forever. And the key insight for us that allowed us to get this going that MFIs, microfinance institutions, didn't get is they didn't get that it doesn't have to be an income generating loan. So microfinance institutions only wanted to lend if they knew that someone was going to start a business, start selling clothes, buy a cow and sell the milk. They only wanted to make loans if they saw that kind of cash flow in the system. And what we helped them to understand is that all of these hundreds of billions of dollars could be redirected to repaying these loans because of the coping costs people were paying. So that's where we are with, with water credit. And what we looked at next, this was actually, uh, Matt and I were in India about three years ago. And we we're on a site visit. And we were in the back of a Jeep, uh, traveling around looking at projects, talking to our partners who were making these loans, the microfinance institutions. So we were asking them all kinds of questions about their business and how it's going, and asking what would it take for them to go faster? How could they scale this up even faster? And their point was, you know, we don't have consistent access to affordable capital from the capital markets. Sometimes the capital is there. We can go out and get the loans and then do the micro loans to the households. Sometimes it's not there. Sometimes it's more expensive than others. And so Matt and I were talking about this. It's like, you know, we know that there are people in the U.S. that if they could provide capital and investment and get even a modest financial return on that, but help millions or tens of millions of people to get water and sanitation, we felt like that was viable. We felt like we could raise that, that type of capital. Because let's face it, I mean, there's only so much charity, but if you could give somebody a proposition of reaching millions of people with water and they get their capital back, that should unlock a whole bunch more capital to put towards the solution. So that's what we did when we launched water credit or water equity. So water equity now is spinning off from water.org as a separate entity. Water.org will continue to be the engine that drives more solutions like microfinance in this space and drives more demand for investment capital to scale that up. Water equity will be the engine that brings in all that additional investment capital to help these solutions go bigger and to spread. So water equity will be providing those modest financial returns to investors at the same time that it's in using that capital to reach more people with water and sanitation. So we're going to raise and deploy capital with water equity. We'll use that pipeline of water credit that's like churning and building more institutions that need capital. And we'll raise our capital and deploy through that. We'll provide the technical assistance that these institutions need to be able to have a smart business plan to deploy the capital. And then, very importantly, donors and investors, particularly investors, they know what their financial return is. That's very easy to measure. We're going to rigorously measure the social impact and report back to them as well, so they'll know how many people are getting access to these services. So the first fund that we did was $11 million. We raised that uh, in equity capital. We deployed it in India, and it's already reached more than 150,000 people with water and sanitation just since last fall when we deployed the funds. That was through our accredited investors. Accredited investors are individuals 
who have more than a million dollars of investable assets. So we kind of started from the top down, and we're continuing to work with accredited investors to raise our next fund. But we've also launched an online platform at waterequity.org where anybody here can come and make a loan as little as $100 into a loan pool that will be then used to get more people access to water and sanitation over two years. And then you have the option to have your loan repaid or to roll it over. So we wanted to democratize this so that anybody could come at a social problem, not just from the perspective of charity, which is still important, but to give everybody more options in terms of how they attack these problems. So the first fund I mentioned will reach at least 730,000 people. We're thinking it actually will probably climb to more than a million over the life of that $11 million fund. So that's over seven years. So again, you know, that's a million people that's going to be reached with capital that can be recycled and doesn't have to be charity. The next fund that we're launching, and we've, uh, it's a $50 million fund. We've raised $10 million in commitments for that one so far. And that'll reach about 4.6 million people over the life of that fund. So just quickly how it works. You know, the investors come in, make the loan to water equity. We partner with the microfinance institutions, and we'll be partnering with other enterprises that provide water and sanitation services like water kiosks, toilet manufacturers, etc. Water equity invests in those through water credit. And then the end borrowers get those two $300 loans to build the toilets and then, or to build the toilets to get the water connections. They repay their loans to the MFIs I showed earlier. Those are repaid at 99%. And then water equity gets repaid and then we repay the investors. So it's basically this, this cycle that can continue to, to grow and we can add more capital to this because we see a pipeline that's far greater than what charity can solve for. And we see a pipeline that's far greater than what local capital markets in these countries are taking in. So that's the complexity of it. Hopefully, uh, I've been able to distill it a bit so that it makes sense. Because like I said, it's a little bit more complex than we were in our early days of doing direct impact and drilling wells. But the key to this is we've been in this sector since 1990. And the reason why I think we can succeed at this is because we have developed the insights as to how this market for water and sanitation works at the base of the pyramid, how these coping costs work and how much money people are putting into that. And it's a matter of just nudging this system a little bit so that we can bring in this type of capital that will free up the poor from these water mafias who are selling water and from the loan sharks who are paying, you know, charging 125% interest. So that's the, the concept, is like, let's really understand this market and then bring the capital in so that it'll work. So I think we'll go to Q&A. Yeah. Hey, thank you for what you do and for sharing with us. Um, I'm curious if water.org has ever considered addressing issues of uh, water access domestically. Um, what that could look like for populations in colonias along the U.S.-Mexico border, the rural poor, places like Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. um, and Native American reservations. Yeah, so while we certainly have a point of view on a lot of those things and how the, those problems should be solved, we feel like we have a specific set of expertise that really lends itself more to understanding the, the base of the pyramid in developing countries. Uh, there certainly are a lot of avenues by which those domestic problems can be solved. Uh, you know, the U.S. government, the Indian Health Service, there's a lot of people who are focusing on that. So a lot of what we've, you know, what I've said oftentimes, our success at water.org has been determined more by what we say no to than what we say yes to. And so we've been very focused on developing countries and making sure that we could have the greatest impact there. So, yeah. And more. Hey, Gary. Um, I'm glad you used the word water mafia because I wrote it down and I wasn't sure if it was appropriate to, to use that <laughs> yeah. term. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're dealing with the government relationship infrastructure? Because it sounds mm -hmm. like 
and maybe this, I'm not right, it's a one house at a time okay. effort, but yet you've got the water mafia who's probably um, working against you in some mm -hmm. of these situations. Mm -hmm. How have you dealt with the broader issue of getting the government to deal with the infrastructure problem so that you get at the root of mm -hmm. you, you know, the access issue? Yeah, that, that's really important. By the water mafia too, what we're talking about are those, those local vendors who go around and sell water. But one of the things about them is it's not an incredibly profitable business, believe it or not. It's just really inefficient to move water around on carts with donkeys as opposed to putting it through pipes in the ground. So there's not that much of an entrenched interest that, that people who are getting water connections aren't necessarily a big threat to, to that whole industry. But the government is a key piece of this. So this is never going to be completely solved by you know, water credit and by coming at this from the bottom up. But the bottom up is key to doing that. It's going to require capital from the top down so that there is infrastructure for the poor to connect to. And so what we believe what we're doing is we're actually helping deliver paying customers to the utilities. So hopefully that will give them more incentive to expand the infrastructure. We're helping them capture those connection fees so that they can use that to capitalize expansion of the systems. So it really is a, a mutually reinforcing approach that we're taking. One more time for Gary. Please give it up. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. All right, up next we have Komol. She is the founder and CEO of Copia. Copia is rated one of the top three startups run by women in the US. She was recently awarded University of California's 30 Under 30 Global Food Chain Make Change Maker, 2016 Social Entrepreneur of the Year, named by Fast Company as one of the most creative people in business, and by Toyota as Toyota's mother of invention. Komal is also the recipient of the Nelson Mandela Humanitarian Award. Please give it up. Thank you, Kelsey and Michael. Um, and everyone for being here today. It is an honor and privilege. My name is Komal Ameth, and I, before we begin here, I'd love to see a quick show of hands. How many of you have attended a wedding, a conference, had a lunch at a Vegas buffet, and wondered what happens to all of the leftover food? Does it just magically disappear? Does the bride take it home? Unfortunately, in most cases, it ends up in the trash. And that's why I'm here to share how my team and I are changing that reality. And in doing so, solving the world's dumbest problem, hunger. It was over five years ago today that I brought that concept to reality. It's, and it's amazing to think that you and I could use the same technology that we use to take a selfie, to request an Uber or Lyft, to now connect those with excess food to those in need of it. And I'm not going to lie, it's a little surreal to be standing on the other side of this podium. Truth be told, as a daughter of Pakistani immigrants, I wasn't even supposed to be here. Let me explain. When I was growing up, I had four specific career paths laid out to me. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, or complete failure. Well, I always secretly wanted to be a Bollywood actress. It could happen. Um, I did what was expected of me, and I decided that I was going to pursue the physician track because that's, that, that's the only way that I thought I could help people. And when I was 18 years old, I got serious about planning my life. I was going to go to Berkeley and study integrated biology. I was going to train to become a doctor in the Navy. I was going to fall madly in love. I'd get married right after graduating college, have my first kid at the age of 28 after I finished my surgical residency. And as you can imagine, absolutely nothing went according to plan. Except I did fall in love. It just wasn't with a person. It was a, an idea. Looking back at my journey, I realized that it was one lunch that ultimately transformed me from a starry-eyed 18-year-old doctor-to-be to a 27-year-old pragmatic CEO of my own tech company. I was a student at Berkeley at the time, and I was walking down Telegraph Avenue when I encountered a homeless man begging for food. Something about him compelled me to stop and invite him to join me for lunch. And during lunch, he sat across from me, just scarfing down his food. 
So he was unbelievably hungry. And in between bites, he shared a story. He said, my name is John. I just came back from my second tour in Iraq. I've been waiting weeks for my military benefits to kick in. And because they haven't, you know, I haven't eaten in three days. Imagine, like three whole days without food. And I was outraged. I mean, it doesn't really matter what your politics are, right? This is a veteran, someone who had given the most selfless sacrifice for our country, only to come home to face yet another battle, that of hunger and homelessness. And then adding insult to injury, right across the street, Berkeley's dining hall is throwing away thousands of pounds of perfectly edible food. And what I realized in that moment was the stark reality of those who have and waste, and those who are in need and starve, and those two people right across the street from one another. Growing up, I was reminded by my parents, Ekomal, don't throw away your food. People in Pakistan are starving. Though well-intentioned and true, people are starving actually here, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, where one in six don't know where their next meal is coming from. Women, men, children, right here. And while this is happening, over 365 million pounds of perfectly edible food is wasted. So clearly it's not a lack of food that's the issue. It's an ineffective distribution of that food. So hunger is not a scarcity problem, it's a logistics problem. And resolving this disparity soon became my life mission. So much so that I broke away from my carefully planned track my predetermined destiny, my brown girl dreams. And after my conversation with John, the homeless veteran, I marched right up to our dining hall managers and I asked them, what do you do with your excess food? And they said, well, we try not to have any. I was like, okay, well, how often does that actually work out for you? And after a lot of prodding, they admitted that they do have a lot of excess food, but they have to throw it away. And so I asked the obvious question, why would you throw it away when you could go right across the street to people in People's Park and donate it? They said, because of liability, we don't do that. And I was like, yeah, you know, homeless people's high-powered attorneys are standing by just to sue you. And I thought it was such a ridiculous excuse. You were going to sell this food to us 10 minutes ago at full price, and now it's not good enough for people who are actually in need to be able to consume it? And I wasn't going to take no for an answer, and so I went online and I did some research of my own. And I discovered that in 1996, Congress had passed the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. And it protects all donors, regardless of whether you're a corporation, organization, or individual from any liability. I also discovered that in the last 20 years, the number of lawsuits or legal claims that have been filed against any business or individual has been zero. So your second cousin twice removes golf buddy's uncle whose hotel shut down, that just doesn't exist. It's just that everyone has a story about it. And so I printed all of this out, I took it to the executive director of our dining hall, and I said, I want to start this donation program, here's all the protection, this is how I'm going to do it, and let's make it happen. And I'm pretty sure he just wanted to get me out of his office, so in less than 10 minutes he agreed, and we started one of the first food recovery organizations on a college campus. And it was essentially a student-powered food recovery movement. Recovering from our dining halls, our on-campus events, our stadium, our arena, and then redistributing it directly to nonprofits in need. And it was a great start, uh, and an idea that I'd completely fallen in love with. But like most of you have, who have fallen in love, uh, you greatly underestimate how difficult it'll actually be. So one day, I'm sitting in class, and our dining hall manager calls me. He says, hey, Komal, you know, no one came to this event, so we have 500 gourmet sandwiches left over. They need to be picked up in two hours, otherwise we're going to have to throw them away. We need the fridge space. Do you want them? And I'm like, yeah, I want them. So I grab my bag, I dash across campus, I jump into a zip car, because I don't have a car at the time. I go through all the one-way streets up to our loading dock, and then I see that there's no cart. So I'm like getting all of these 500 sandwiches one by one into the, into the van while I'm blasting the AC so that this food can actually stay cold because it's perishable. And then frantically, I'm trying to you know, get all of this food in, and then finally I slam my trunk, and I'm like, Phew. like, thank you. God, this is great food. Of course there's going to be nonprofits that want to eat it. And so then I proceed to call 30 plus nonprofits in Berkeley, in Oakland, even as far as Richmond. I'm like, hey, I have this amazing food. Could you use it? Hey, I have 500 gourmet sandwiches. Do you need them? A third of them don't answer the phone. A third of them say, no, we're cool. We don't need any more for today. The last third, yeah, actually we could use 10 sandwiches or 15 sandwiches. Like, awesome, now I have 475 sandwiches. And I'm literally on the side of the road so frustrated. 
why is it so hard to do a good thing? Why is it so hard to do the right thing? And where are all the hungry people at when I actually have amazing food? And it's while I'm sitting on the side of the road and I'm trying to extend my zip car reservation because I still have 475 sandwiches in my trunk. And I can't because someone's already booked it. So I was like, this is Murphy's Law in action, man. It's OK. The next person who gets the car, they're going to pop the trunk. They're going to have 475 sandwiches. It's going to be their problem. Uh, but in actuality, I thought, you know, how much more effective and efficient this would be if those who have food, those who have food could say, hey, we have food. And those in need of food could say, hey, we could use that food. And we could match these two people and clear the marketplace and clear, cr uh, create a clear value for both of them. A you know, a total win-win. And so that's what we've built. Copia is industry-changing industry technology that allows businesses and events with excess food to request a pickup of that food and have it delivered to feed communities in need. What's different about Copia is that we are a for-profit company designed to solve both food waste and hunger at scale. So how does it work? Well, let's say you're Google and you have a bunch of food left over at the end of the day. Instead of throwing it away, you would go onto our app and you would request a pickup. You'd say, this is the amount of food that I have. This is the smallest size of vehicle it could be transported in. And that's it. And then our algorithm will match that exact amount and type of food to the nearest nonprofit or nonprofits that could accept it at that day, at that time. It'll also dispatch one of our food heroes to go pick up this food and drop it off directly to the nonprofit. As once a nonprofit receives it, they sign a digital tax deduction receipt, and uh, then they'll send back photos and testimonials of the people that were fed. So the food provider gets to see the impact that they made by spending essentially less than two minutes of their time going copia. This has proven to be a huge value for corporate social responsibility efforts for businesses. It engages employees internally, and externally you get to show the world that you are a responsible, sustainable citizen. But we're also impacting the bottom line, and we do so in three very important ways. So regardless of if you, if, if you manage your food, or if you use a company like Sodexo or Aramark, we help you eliminate the disposal costs associated with surplus food. We provide you an easy to use dashboard that allows you to see the analytics. You could see it by your cafeteria, you could see it by day of the, day of the week, you could see it by the weather outside and how did that impact, how many people actually came to work. Um, and it also provides you ways to reduce overpurchasing and overproduction in the future. Third, and what you know, businesses really like, is that they can now receive the maximum enhanced tax deduction for their food donations with digital receipts and it's audit proof because we streamline this entire process and we make sure that every nonprofit signs it after every donation. This quarter, we've, received, we've achieved our goal of recovering over 460,000 pounds of food. And 460,000 pounds of food is like filling the entire Warriors Oracle Arena 20 times over. And since I'm a Bay, from the Bay Area, go Warriors. Um, and in the doing so, we've helped our partnering businesses save over $5 million. Um, and I'm thrilled to share that this year, we will feed over 1 million people all with food that would have otherwise been wasted. So, thanks guys. Can I get some water? So I'm gonna share a few quick success stories. Um, last year, the Super Bowl was hosted in the Bay Area, and our partnership with the NFL meant that we were able to recover over 14 tons of incredible food. And 14 tons, to put it in perspective, is four 16-foot refrigerated trucks filled from the top to bottom, not with popcorn and hot dogs, but $300 cheeses, lobster rolls, filet mignon, pulled pork sandwiches. Not my jam, but you know, really incredible food for the people that we serve. And also, in doing so, we fed over 23,000 people in just two days. I'm gonna take a sip of water now. And this past February, Copia went to Hollywood to partner with the Academy Awards, Women in Film, Vanity Fair, Slumdog Superstar, Frida Pinto, and Chef Thomas Keller to ensure that for the first time ever, no food went to waste Oscars weekend. And for, the, for those of you who may not know, 
The Vanity Fair post-Oscars party is one of the most exclusive events that you could get into. This year, it was catered by Chef Thomas Keller, who is the founder of the three, star, three Michelin star restaurant, uh, French Laundry. And, you know, by partnering with us, we recovered all of that food and fed over 40 Iranian and Syrian refugees who had just come to America. And, you know, through us, they were able to eat literally the bougiest food on the planet from the most exclusive party. And that was their first meal. And when, was, when all was said and done, we enabled over 1,100 people to eat like a star. And to take another and more frequent recurrence, because you could be like, okay, well, these events happen, you know, once a year, big deal. Uh, you know, organizers at a local tech conference requested Copia pick up their excess food. They were expecting 1,400 attendees in just uh, over the course of three days. And so just a few hundred pounds of food. And when we went there, what we came to find was actually enough food to feed over 53 hundred people. And guys, this is one conference in one city in one day. Imagine how many conferences are happening today alone. And um, pardon my French, but that's a shit ton of food. Copious technology, its massive driver fleet, its 21st century convenience, and its benefits empower businesses to move towards becoming more socially responsible and economically efficient than ever before. Copia is a no-brainer for every business, large or small, and that includes all of yours. Hunger, like I said before, is not a scarcity problem. It's a logistics problem. And because of that, we know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it is true, we're not the first organization to actually attempt food recovery, but we are one of the world's most effective. The idea of sharing food with those in need is not revolutionary or brand new, but Copia strives to make that process as easy and as intelligent as possible. We've built Copia to be for profit, for scale, to address these issues and actually to solve the problem. By automating that process and centering it around technology, we're not recreating the wheel, we're revamping what exists to meet, match the needs and capabilities of our generation. And I'm sure you can agree, it's about time that humanitarianism met modern day technology. It was one transformative lunch with John the Veteran that completely altered my life planned and it led me to finding the true purpose of my life. Pivoting would have terrified the 18-year-old me, but it empowers and invigorates the 27-year-old me. And I finally realized that you can make all the life plans you want. Just remember not to write them in permanent ink, but draw them up in pencil where you can erase them, alter them, challenge and improve them as life comes your way. Be open to the fact that sometimes your life plan and your dreams, no matter how audacious, how grandiose, how impossible sounding, even to you, are never too large to accomplish. In the words of the late and great Muhammad Ali, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small people who prefer to live in a world as it is, instead of using the power they have to challenge it, change it, improve it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. The impossible does not exist. So I ask you, what do you deem impossible? Global warming, solving the refugee crisis, free and fair elections, whatever it may be, there has never been a better time in human history to solve the world's biggest problems. And with technology, it's become more possible than ever before. The world demands Actually, it deserves the very best from its brightest. Something that maybe even you once deemed to be impossible. So I ask you, fellow badasses, when history looks upon our generation, where will they find you? Where will they find your organization? Standing on the sidelines or calling the shots. I urge you all to redefine impossible, to break limits and the standards that even you have set for yourself. And so we're nearing the QA session of this presentation, but before we move on, I invite you to join Copia. As a customer, as a partner, as a pre-existing food recovery organization, investor, team member, or even fan. Together, let's use our potential, our talents, our skills, and our abilities to conquer the impossible. We're moving humanitarianism forward, and we want everyone to be part of this movement. Nine years ago, it would have been impossible to imagine standing here before you as a CEO of my own company. 
And yet, here I am, reminding you that impossible is just a word. Thank you. That was great. We have time for one or two questions. Um, I, there was a sort of middleman in there, or people who pick up the food and deliver it. Can you talk a little bit about who those people are? Are they employed? Are they volunteers? Yeah, Thank great you. question. So here in the, well, not here, but in the Bay Area, they're employed by us. They're previously recipients of our food. They're previously homeless individuals, veterans. Uh, so the idea that's not just a handout, but a hand up. So we pay for them there. They're 1099 contractors. But what we've realized is that you know we didn't, like I said before, invent the concept of food recovery. So this is happening in pockets across America from very well-intentioned nonprofits that are just technology strapped. So now as we expand, we're partnering with those uh, organizations that have pre-existing like volunteer networks and giving them the driver technology, giving them the most effective routing, giving them the platform that they need so that we could bring their donors on as customers, their nonprofits on as like being able to you know, uh, modify their needs and what they need, what kind of food they need, when they need it. And so that's what we're doing so that we don't necessarily have to build Uber while we're building Copia. Thanks, hi, Suzanne at hi. Salesforce. And we really want to use you guys at Dreamforce this year, our big conference, and I think we got stuck at the unions. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk about that? Is that common and how can we like, help bust that cycle? Yeah, I mean, I think Truth be told, I think whenever there's a will, there's a way. And that every time, I mean, I've heard no so many times, that it's really no is easier, it's easier to say no than it is to say yes, because yes requires action. And yeah, I mean, people have said, even in the hotel industry, when we're partnering with hotels, they're like, oh, well, there's unions, like, we won't be able to, like, recover this food. And we've always just found a way. Like I said, that, like, where there's a will, there's a way, this is the right thing to do. And so I'm not really sure, and I'm not totally certain on the details of like why the union was even an issue in that's, that scenario. But I mean, I think that it's nothing that's not insurmountable, especially given Dreamforce is such a massive event. It could feed thousands of people. Thanks, though. We should talk after. We've not encountered it yet. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's other things out there. There's the mafias out there. Apparently, they control waste management. So I'm sure we're going to encounter things like that. It's just we're going to figure out how to move through. And especially now, actually, in California. So the, um, the state of California uh, passed SB 1383, which requires every jurisdiction uh, to actually have a 20, it has a 20% food recovery mandate. So businesses are now actually being forced to be, to be a part of this. Otherwise, they'll fa face massive fines. So I think overall, it, the society is moving towards that. Awesome, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, for our final speaker, we have Annie Tway. She brings 10 years of experience in designing for consumer packaging and brand identity, and now serves as the co-founder and chief of creative and design at Cooley Cooley, where she oversees the consistency in the development of its brand platform and packaging and plays a strong advocate for a memorable consumer experience. It. Hey everyone, um, I'm here to tell you about the story of a superfood that revitalized an island nation. So we'll start with a video. Most of development initiatives in Haiti fail because of an issue of approach. If you look around Haiti, the only people who can plant trees are farmers. And they've pretty well been abandoned. The building has barely begun. Very little has made it directly to the Haitian people. Our logo is a tree, and our business is about the outdoors. The possibilities are endless. The real way to do it sustainably is to have local people contribute. To Motunek, we wanted to be able to pay the farmers to plant and protect trees. 
We took this idea to the Timberland Shoe Company. They said, brilliant idea, but what happens when we stop paying for it? This is the future of agricultural export, right here. This is where it starts. It's not a personal business. It's a business for a population. So I have been very been dead. Est-ce que mon David ne veut couper Non, non, pas aimer mon couper. Mais je vais me récolter lui. Quand mettre le col avec le moins. À crédit à l'aide de qui faut une boutique là pour ça. This is the Moringa nursery. We would launch in partnership with Whole Foods. We teach them what we're doing, why we do it, so that they can continue by themselves. Nothing in life is easy. If it's easy, it's not an objective. Après moment la saison pour nous ta faire nous pour gagner. Alors c'est doit c'est pour la pour vous le pays. If you can transform this land, there's nothing you can't do. Haiti. Haiti has been long met with instability and natural disasters. Decades of decline and impinging plantation monoculture has led to widespread deforestation. Today, the country is 98% deforested. As you can see from this image, that's the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Deforestation could lead to increased damage and impact from tropical storms, access to food, water, and sustainable livelihoods. What you just saw was a clip from Cone Beach. It's a story chronicling the partnership between an NGO leader and also an uh, agronomist. Now, they believe that by planting millions of trees and increasing crop yield, they'll be able to actually improve the forests in Haiti and improve livelihoods. And they do this through a method called agroforestry. Now, to ensure the sustainability of their work and their progress, and also the funding that they also took on to, <coughs> to build the livelihoods and the economies in Haiti, they're looking for partners in the U.S., international partners that can actually help tell the story of Haiti and grow demand for Haiti, Haitian products. And that's where we come in. Meet Cooley Cooley. So Cooley Cooley is a food startup and social enterprise based in the Bay Area. We were founded in 2012 by four founders of diverse backgrounds. Now we all shared one common vision and one big idea. If we can build a sustainable business, a business that actually has a bottom line and actually has a mission to plant more trees and improve livelihoods around the world, then we've got something going. Who here likes to eat salad? Who here feels like that you don't get enough veggies in your diet? Anyone? Is it kind of a pain tearing up those kale leaves? It gets expensive. Well, a Hartman Group report actually discovered that 68%, more than two thirds of Americans are looking for more convenient ways to get their greens on the go. In addition, Americans are more concerned about the transparency of the food products. So if you ever go to Whole Foods, uh, any retailer pick up um, a convenience product, you're always going to look at the packaging, you're going to look at the label, look at the ingredient statements, but you also wonder where do these ingredients come from and does that matter and how does that impact the planet? Meet Moringa. Moringa is a small leafy tree. It grows fast and it thrives in dry arid climates and also in tropical climates. What's fascinating about Moringa is the leaves 
of the moringa tree are actually more nutrient dense than kale. In a side by side comparison with kale, moringa pr provides more protein, more calcium, iron, fiber. In addition, it's a complete plant protein, which means it has all nine essential amino acids. Studies have also suggested that moringa contains very unique compounds that could help people with diabetes, iron deficiency anemia. It could help vegans and vegetarians because the iron, the protein, and all the nutrients. In addition, it's been shown to increase lactation in, in young mothers. It helps cardiovascular disease. And it's been shown that moringa may also reduce chronic inflammation, which is something that a lot of Americans are becoming more concerned about. Now here's the most incredible thing about moringa. Because of where moringa grows and because it is so fast growing in these dry, arid, and even tropical climates, as you can see on the map, moringa the areas or regions where Moringa thrives coincides with areas in the world that experience high rates of malnutrition. In fact, Moringa has been used as a tool to reduce malnutrition, improve access to nutrition, and a lot of, the, in many parts of the developing world. One of those organizations is the Haiti Smallholders Farmers Alliance. Now, as you saw in that video, SFA is looking for a partnership to help tell their story and actually help grow demand of a particular plant, Moringa. Moringa grows very, very well in Haiti. In fact, you don't have to clear the land or chop down trees to grow Moringa. Moringa grows densely it could be grown in a method called agroforestry, which is intercropping plants between existing crops. And furthermore, because it's so fast growing, the leaves can be harvested year round, and the stems and waste from the tree can go back into the soil to help fertilize the soil. Now that's incredible. And by growing more moringa trees, they can develop root systems to help rebuild the land in Haiti. So they met Kuli Kuli. And we met them. And through a partnership, we created Moringa Green Energy Shots. Made with Haitian Moringa. Now that's incredible. We've launched in Whole Foods, in partnership with Whole Foods, across the nation, and now these products are available to all Americans. And not just in Whole Foods. We're online, on Amazon.com, we're on Thrive, we're in Sprouts, Safeway Albertsons. We're in over 2,000 stores, and we're growing. Now these products, Hopefully by the end of 2017, we'll be in over 3,500 stores. But what does that mean? What does it mean to offer Moringa to American consumers? How does that impact Haiti? You see, by purchasing more Moringa products, by understanding what Moringa is, you find ways to nourish yourself and get more greens on the go. You don't have to sit around and tear up your kale leaves. You could just purchase Moringa and know that the Moringa is coming from a place, a source that matters. And doing, by doing so, you're able to plant more Moringa trees. By growing demand, we can plant more Moringa trees, work with more farmers across the planet, and teach them how to grow more Moringa. And in addition, we'll improve their livelihoods, improve access to nutrition. So how this works is farmers can grow Moringa 
for their own local markets. They can plant, cultivate, harvest, process, but with the help of a number of these NGOs, these organizations such as SFA. And they can utilize that moringa in their local markets. They can make a living in their local communities. Now, by increasing crop yield of moringa, they can export. And that's where a company like Cooley Cooley comes in. And that's what makes this so incredible. To date, we've supported over 800 moringa farmers around the world. And we planted over 200,000 trees. Now, as a company, we launched our first product in 2013. We crowdfunded our first product, Moringa Bars, launched with Whole Foods. But since then, we've actually grown our product line. We have these energy shots, and they're all available in your local Whole Foods stores. Um, they're available online. We've also launched our Pure Moringa Powder, in its purest form, it's 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, and we're also working with our Moringa suppliers to become fair trade. Now think about that. We'd be the first company to help our Moringa farmers become fair trade. Now that says a lot because we care about our quality standards. We care about the kind of water that they're using. We care about their soil. We care about the farmers. We care about everyone in the supply chain. And furthermore, Cooley Cooley is now a certified benefit corporation. So our mission is built into our legal DNA. Now, I don't know if you've heard, early this year, we successfully closed our Series A which was led by Kellogg's, and we were able to close $4.25 million. That is a huge feat, coming from raising $50,000 on Indiegogo back in 2012 or 2013 to launch our first product to over $4 million to help grow our business, but most importantly, invest in our supply chain and work with more mar Moringa farmers or help farmers grow Moringa so they can actually earn a livelihood. So there are three things that we're really looking for your help on. One is we're looking for organizations, nonprofits, um, Moringa suppliers, or anyone interested in growing the Moringa supply chain. We're also looking for foundations that are interested in investing or the financial aspect of the supply chain. Two, we're also looking for other like-minded companies that are interested in co-marketing with us, help tell the story of Moringa, but not only that, the importance of social and environmental impact and doing social good as profit, for-profit businesses. And third, the number one thing you can do today to help grow our impact and help our mission is to go to your local Whole Foods, Safeway Albertsons, Sprouts, Publix. In fact, you could go onto our website and find a list of stores near you and try Moringa for yourselves. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So often when the U.S. picks up a new like food craze, the country that is growing the product exports the product and then sometimes that becomes unaffordable to the people on the ground. And there's a ton of examples like this, like quinoa in Peru and other countries, Bolivia. Um, are you doing anything to protect the cost of this plant in Haiti or to help people with... Yeah malnutrition in Haiti and not just here? Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, it's a question we get asked a lot. Um, the difference between <clears throat> Moringa and quinoa is Moringa is fast growing and it grows 
everywhere. It's like a weed. It's unlike quinoa, which has to grow at certain elevations. Um, and so in terms of supply, it's nearly unlimited. Um, the other great thing about Moringa is it grows very well in poor soil, which is why it does grow in very arid parts of the world where other plants and other crops do not grow. Um, so that's the first thing. The second is Moringa has a such high amount of nutrients. In fact, it's probably the number two um, most nutritious plant on the planet. I mean, it's, it's known as a miracle tree. A lot, of, um, a lot of cultures already utilize Moringa for themselves, but they don't use it like you would quinoa. Quinoa is like something you would eat in copious amounts, whereas Moringa is something you can just add a little bit of, and that density of nutrients from just a small amount of product is really all they need. Um, so I hope that answers your question. What elevation and what inputs? What elevation does Moringa grow in? Um, it grows like low or, or mid elevation. It's not a, a high elevation plant. Um, so for example, it grows very well in like West Africa, I uh, think desert climates. Um, I think it's a little different from coffee, which requires a certain elevation, like a higher elevation. So you mentioned being a benefit corp. Uh, are you a certified B Corp or a, a public benefit corporation or both? Both. Okay, cool. Yep. And have you guys been a PBC since you incorporated or have you changed recently? So we recently changed to become benefit corporation, but we've been certified B Corp since I think early last year. Awesome. Thanks again, Annie. Yeah, great. Thank you.